Welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I'm Alex Hopkins, taking over for Tammy Schaefer, your regular on-air producer. And this week, we are focusing on the legislative preview. And we can't have a legislative preview without the state party leaders. So with us, we have the Democratic State Party Chair Leader, Morgan Carroll. And uh, we've got Jeff Watson here, President of the Colorado Business Roundtable, to field those questions. So uh, welcome, Jeff. Welcome, Morgan. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, we're excited to, to have a conversation uh, with our party leadership in Colorado. Uh, Morgan Carroll, a former state legislator elected to this position. So, Morgan, let's just kind of start off with a little bit of some background for those that aren't familiar with the role of a state party chairman, what that looks like when you were elected, and some of the responsibilities you have as state chair. Well, that's uh, a great question. Um, I actually think the role's changing. Traditionally, the role of the state party has been to do a lot of the party business, getting candidates elected, uh, doing candidate recruitment, doing training, supporting the county parties, doing caucuses, conventions, assemblies. That's a lot of the infrastructure of the party. But more so than ever, we're needing to also make sure that we are connecting with grassroots movements, that we are really engaging volunteers. I would actually venture to say probably both parties are also in the process of redefining what the role of the parties are in this moment in time in a state where the majority of our voters are actually unaffiliated. Morgan, to that end, um, there's been certainly a lot of discussion about the financial aspects of the state party and the role of the state party and, and either raising money or um, there's a lot of the activists on both sides that are questioning whether the money's better sent to the party or to candidates. How do you answer that question about the financial aspects and, and where donors' money is best spent? Well, so... It's always rewarding when there's a candidate that someone just really personally likes and gets excited about. And I definitely think people should support the people that best speak to their values. But the unique role of the party is long-term community building, infrastructure building. At the end of the day, and as a former term limited legislator, I, I, I can say this, you know, candidates come and go and across different races. And we can't reinvent the wheel um, just back and forth on such short notice. It kind of has this accordion effect. If we were to only focus on the candidates, we kind of find ourselves in this position of reinventing the wheel every short cycle for every single race. So the benefit of the party is long-term investment in things like uh, voter registration, voter education, talking about platform priorities, messaging priorities, and we're in the position to help all Democrats get elected across multiple cycles, whereas the, the contribution you're going to make for a candidate hopefully will help that candidate win, but then you're starting over again afterwards. You mentioned being a termed legislator. You certainly spent some time at the Capitol and, and also as a candidate uh, for Congress in CD6 against Congressman Kaufman. What do you take from those experiences, both as a candidate and as a uh, state legislator, that, that you're using in this new role? Probably the biggest takeaway I've had is that these are and should be lifelong learning positions, and at the end of the day, everything is always about people. Over 12 years of serving there and being a candidate, I've had thousands of conversations with different voters there. And for the most part, people want to know that they're being heard, that someone's being thoughtful, and that there's at least someone truly trying to advocate for their interests at different levels of government. Um, I would actually say the majority of people are not diehard partisans, um, although we definitely have some on both sides. My take is that people are more interested generally in issues and solutions and feeling some kind of personal connection and that they're being heard. And at the same time, I think we're in a moment, uh, and maybe this is more about the federal level and Congress in D.C., but there is a crisis of confidence in government. Is anyone really listening out there? Is anyone really paying attention? And is anyone really focusing on the needs of regular people? Or has this become purely political sport? Um, and, you know, voters are 
innocent hostages or bystanders in the middle of this. Um, I think one of our challenges on the Democratic Party it isn't really about us at the end of the day. We have to make sure that the campaigns that we're running, that the candidates that we're running, but also how we govern stays true to a magnetic north that is fundamentally trying to make life better for everyday Coloradans and not get so intoxicated with our own Kool-Aid that we forget the most important part of this whole job, which is making sure we're actually representing our communities. You mentioned being heard, and I think there's a lot of people that would speak to uh, the reason today that we have President Donald Trump in the White House is because there was a large segment um, across the political spectrum, Democrats included, that felt they weren't being heard uh, by current leadership. How do you respond or answer to that? Do you agree with that statement, or are there other factors at play that, that, that the Democratic Party need to pay attention to? Well, I do think there's a lot of factors we need to pay attention to, um, and I agree largely with the thought that in some ways Trump's election was more a symbolic repudiation of anything that people thought was the status quo, and I, I don't think it was even about one particular candidate. I think it was almost a proxy vote for just frustration, not really for what he had to offer, um, but it was, I see, sort of an SOS or, or frankly a cry for help. Um, I think people were essentially casting, not all, um, a protest vote. Um, I think what we need to learn from this is not only that we need to be listening and learning, but I think myself included, I went into that election and found him to be such an incredible, unqualified person. It just seemed almost impossible that he could actually get elected. And I think there's just a sort of humility at the end of the day that we can take nothing for granted, no vote for granted, no voter for granted, no volunteer for granted, um, no matter who the candidate is. And frankly, from our point of view, how appallingly unqualified and offensive they are, there is no such thing as a shoe in, never has been, and never will be on any race. And so I think the wake-up call for us is that we just have to be better and do better about connecting with voters, being relevant on the things they care about, and making sure they are heard so that they have, um, you know, when they're casting their vote, it's not only, you know, against Donald Trump, but it's actually for a responsible vision about how we build our state and our country together and that they're part of it and that they're not feeling left behind. And... <clears throat> I appreciate your sentiments on that, but the fact of the matter is, is that we do have a year of Trump. What what excites you? What worries you about this next year with Trump? Oh gosh. Well, <laughs> I guess I have to start with what worries me. What worries me is I have never seen this level of reckless banter over the size of a nuclear button. I mean, that is the most irresponsible thing I have ever seen on foreign policy. We are backing out of agreements with other countries. And I think those in the business community in particular know that your word is your bond. I mean, you can't – if we go into future negotiations, who is ever going to know whether or not they can take the word of the United States under the leadership of President Trump? I think we had a serious disadvantage on – I mean, the aggressive move to pull out of Iran nuclear talks, the dismantling of climate accords – um, you know, trade agreements are up in the air. It's reckless. It's unpredictable. Nobody knows from day to day where it's going to go. So my fear is that we've got um, someone at the top here who's willing to play fast, loose, and reckless with nuclear buttons, with treaties, with negotiations, with trade. And I feel like the consequences could both be ones that fundamentally affect things like war and peace. And while, you know, at the surface level, it may look like we're seeing some good signs in our economy, underneath this, this kind of erratic leadership, I think, could actually risk both our local and national economies if we're not careful. And I, I'm concerned about the isolationism uh, that is coming out of this. So I, I really feel like everything I personally care about, and I think many people care about is in jeopardy and at risk. That is what I fear under his leadership for a year. Everything I care about in the Constitution, every person's rights, our planet, our relationships, our credibility around the world, I'm profoundly worried about that. 
What I'm hopeful for is I have never seen this much grassroots activism. Um, even two or four years ago, I think one of our biggest challenges overall was just apathy. People, um, you know, caring, you know, should they be engaged, uh, getting involved, voting, participating in their state, local, or federal government on, you know, being part of the policymaking process. Now, what I'm most hopeful for is I see people learning and caring and engaging in the 2017 year that just finished. We saw more people getting involved in our local races than we have ever seen before because they care, they want to be involved, they want to get engaged. It has, you know, there's just been this sense of people waking up with a mission. And when I see that kind of energy and passion and civic mindedness, that is what I am most excited about. Morgan, there it appears that both parties are facing an equal headwind or challenge. It's not uh, exclusive to one of the parties or the other. The divide that seems to be on the surface growing um, between the more moderate wings of both parties and on the Republican side, the far-right Tea Party, or on the left side, the progressive Bernie wings. Uh, how do you square that within your own party, um, that, that that growing ideological divide seems to be increasing and that you're creating these factions within the party? Well, it's a good question. I guess to the first point overall, um, I think the Republican Party is facing a much bigger headwind than the Democratic Party right now. About 60 percent of folks in Colorado are actually happy thinking that Colorado under Democratic control right now with the governor in the House is headed in the right track. And more than that, think that the Republicans at the national level, a lot more than that, are headed in the wrong track. But we do have differences within our party. And at least the way we've dealt with it is we've needed to hear a lot of people. Sometimes those differences fall along policy lines, but sometimes those differences are style um, stylistic, you know, how inclusive is the party, how open to change, how open to new people. And it's important that we realize it's not all a policy division on things. Sometimes it's a style division. What I've needed to do is go out on a listening tour and hear the grievances that people have had. Um, a lot of times they're about the National Party, which is pretty separate from us, to be honest, but we still need to hear that, learn from it. Um, and so the way I've seen this is I have felt like I have something to learn from each of these conversations because mostly people are looking for a way to feel heard and be included. But where we do have some differences of opinion on policy stuff, the way I've always handled this is, look, we need to be a big tent. We can't go down this road of purity tests or we will be a very small party. And I think it is what's happening to the Republican Party. They so aggressively even primary their own. I mean, we saw Steve Bannon doing this and Trump doing this. It's rather extraordinary to see how aggressively, not just that primaries pop up, but that they are recruited to run against their own members is mind blowing to me. And as the majority of this country starts to become unaffiliated, we need, if we're going to stay voter centric and stay relevant in people's lives, our whole country needs a conversation right now about how we talk about issues and how, it, you know, it's not the end of the world to have differences of opinion. We need to know how to air those differences of opinion without necessarily condemning everybody who always disagrees on every other issue. And I think that that's true within the Democratic Party, too. The way I've generally done, you know, I don't find the left-right divide particularly helpful for me in the party. What I've told everybody is that we have to be relevant. You know, it's not a question of, I don't know where the center is, I don't know where the left is, but I do know we either are or are not relevant in solving problems in people's lives. And if we are not relevant, we will be left behind. It's interesting. You mentioned the, the move toward the unaffiliated, and certainly in Colorado with uh, Let Colorado Vote 107-108 that, that appears, uh, depending on who you talk to, to be the end of our political uh, lives here in Colorado, uh, to minimal at best uh, a minor ripple or impact. Um, how do you view the impact of, of those particular pieces of legislation, and what are you doing as a party to prepare to attract those unaffiliated voters? That is a great question. I mean, 
that is a game changer for the party. Uh, we decided pretty quickly after the voters passed this that we were going to proactively reach out to unaffiliated voters and welcome them into the Democratic Party. And it's not just because they need to for primaries. For example, we did a whole public education campaign to unaffiliated because people may think because unaffiliated can vote in the primary that they can participate in the caucuses, and they can't. That's the law. So we wanted to actually reach out to unaffiliated and let them know you actually have a chance to participate even earlier than the primaries. We would welcome you to participate in our caucus process. You know, it is your certain right or freedom to, you know, unaffiliate again afterwards if you want, but you're welcome. Here's how you do it. Uh, so a real increase in public education materials. I think most of our candidates are going to be reaching out to unaffiliated, not just in a general election, but earlier and in a primary, you know, in the primary phase of the election. And it, we're figuring out a little bit as we go because we don't really have a good uh, roadmap here. But at least speaking for us, a lot of our volunteers are actually unaffiliated. And we've backed off. We would love everybody to affiliate and join a new and strengthening, amazing Democratic Party in Colorado. But you know what? If someone wants to get involved and help us on things we're working on and they just they, they are an unaffiliated, we're welcoming anybody who wants to engage on any activity that we're working on. And we hope that with the relationships and the projects we're working on that are meaningful, that people at the end of the day will not just vote Democratic, but hopefully affiliate Democratic. You know, the perception recently have been that the Republicans have kind of had this cattle call and multiple candidates, the D's have been able to, to work out and coalesce behind a single candidate. Uh, this year you have multiple races uh, with the crowded fields, uh, whether it's the governor's race or the state treasurer's race and others. Um, how are you prepared? How are you dealing with that? Is that good or bad for your, uh, for your party? Uh, it's, we really have never seen... You're right, anything like this before. So it's an interesting time to be chair. Um, overall, I think it's just been a, a, an energy of an abundance of people really wanting to be involved. So I think basically this is a good thing. We have a lot of passionate, qualified, just a fantastic bumper crop of candidates. I mean, there's nine people running for governor and five for attorney general, and that is unusual for us. And while it made me a little bit nervous at first, because uh, we have a very strict neutrality policy. So what it's forced us to do is to go through and make sure, like, what are our systems to make sure that we're communicating exactly equally with everybody. We experimented um, with setting up a clean campaign pledge, uh, which is, you know, we don't think we can spend a day or a dollar tearing each other down, but if you've got a great positive vision for how you're going to best represent Colorado, go run on your positive best vision of what you have to offer. And so we've had actually a, I would say, surprisingly clean just because normally primaries aren't really known uh, for being that positive. Um, but we've had great adherence. And our governor's race on this, um, we keep having more candidates sign up to do it. And so the tone is, look, we can't be inward facing and tearing each other down. We need to be outward facing and starting today, even though it's not the general election yet. You're making your case every day really truly to the voter about why you think you've got um, you know, more to offer or the best vision. So while in a perfect world as chair, it's easier if you have one candidate and you can just work with each of those one candidates. Primaries do cost more money. They add expense to a campaign. They add time to a campaign. But uh, one pattern I've seen from every level of office is the motivation to get involved is higher than I have ever seen it. And for many people, the way they're expressing their desire to get in, change the course of where we're doing, um, has been to decide to run for office. So I have to see that as an overall positive as far as um, people just being passionate about getting involved, wanting to get into public service, and, um, you know, feeling very strongly about they cannot sit on the sidelines while things they care about are under attack. 
So that neutrality policy probably takes out my next question about who you're endorsing for governor on air today. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It Torn. does. I love all them right. all equally. How about that? <laughs> Good. They're fantastic. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> what races do you see as most pivotal? Obviously, the state Senate here in Colorado with a one vote, uh, certainly the governor's race. You've got several contested uh, congressional races. Uh, do you put a priority or a focus on any of those? Um, or to you, every race is just as important, and, and especially knowing you've got candidates and personalities involved? I'm talking more well, from a I resource think, perspective, obviously, as a state party. Right, exactly. I, I mean, so to us, the governor's seat is a top priority. Um, what we've seen under Governor Hick and Looper has been an extraordinarily strong growth. And while we think we've been hampered by things like Tabor, um, and it's not to say that we don't have serious infrastructure needs and that you know, the um, but what we are saying is one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country and our wages are starting to go up. Um, the economic and business climate of this state under Hickenlooper's leadership has been really extraordinary. So um, it's not just it's the head of every single state department. It's the judges that come in. It's the final sign off on every single bill that gets brought in the legislature. The governor's race is obviously very, very important. And because we're down by only one seat in the Senate, um, there's a lot of good ideas that should be bipartisan that are not being received in a bipartisan fashion under the current leadership, because as is my view, but I think a lot of the politics behind the Republican Party punishes Republicans who negotiate and work with Democrats. We had a bipartisan transportation deal. It fell down because of Senate Republicans. We have had items on the table that have done so much work to get bipartisan outreach. Um, and that included addressing like higher ed and other issues. And then the political pressures um, have meant it's just impossible to really get done what we need to. So that state Senate is really important. The Democrats are down by one seat there. Um, you know, picking up that majority is going to be a big priority for us. But then let me, let me say this. Um, I think 2018, if we work hard, have great candidates, and are focused on what voters want, I think in light of this climate, we really – are looking at the possibility of a wave year. The local races that we started to focus on adopt the campaign measures in the odd years to get people to realize why they should care about city council, why they should care about school boards. I think this can be a year where we pick up attorney general, secretary of state and treasurer, partly by doing a better job letting people know why they should care. You know, the secretary of state's office is overseeing lobbyists the business community. It's like whether people are getting purged from the voter rolls or the attorney general's office is really the people's lawyer for the state of Colorado. I still think a lot of people may not honestly fully know what the CU region at large does. So if we do a better job getting word out about why people should care about every one of those races, then I think we don't just win top of the ticket with the governor. I think we can be winning county races. I think we can win the down ticket statewide races um, and really have a potential promise for a sweep in 2018. Nothing happens by itself. We are not, you know, assuming that happens. But if we work hard and do what we can, that potential is really there for us. That is wonderful. And I have one last question for you in these last 30 seconds. What are your thoughts about Oprah running for president in 2020? I would be so delighted to get behind <laughs> somebody who represents my values. I think she's a fantastic person. I think there's also a lot of other great choices. So I'm certainly not going to be weighing in. I mean, the neutrality will apply for president, too. But I will say <laughs> this, that her speech at the Golden Globe was what needed to be heard in this larger Me Too movement. And I think that she is an amazing woman. And I would look forward to any next president that has a vision of hope and responsibility and inclusion and respect and dignity, and she certainly could be one of them. Morgan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, you guys. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks, Barga. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, my name is Alex Hopkins, and uh, this is Connect and Collaborate, I'm filling in for Tammy Schaefer, your regular on-air producer, and this week we are talking legislative session preview. So legislative session started last week, and uh, we have had a chance to sit down with a few people, and today we are sitting down with House Majority Leader Casey Becker, the Democratic House Majority Leader, I should state that, and uh, we have President of the Colorado Business Roundtable with us, Jeff Wasden. Hello, Casey, and hello, Jeff. Hi, Alex. <laughs> How are you today? Great. How are you? Fantastic. Thank Doing you. Doing excellent. Casey, it's great to have you on the show, and it's great to uh, start off another legislative session here in 2018. Obviously, we, uh, we've heard from the governor and leadership uh, from the podium as the session starts, but um, for those that may not know you, we'd really like to just kind of start with an opportunity for you to, to get to uh, share kind of the district that you represent, how long you've served um, in the House there for our listeners. Thanks, Jeff. So I represent House District 13. I live in Boulder, and I represent western Boulder County, Gilpin, uh, which is where the casinos are, Clear Creek County, which is um, Idaho Springs, Georgetown area, uh, Grand County, which is Winter Park, Granby, Grand Lake, Kremlin area, and Jackson County um, which is God's country in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. And uh, how long have you been in leadership? I was elected to leadership by my peers um, in November 2016, and so it's just been a little bit over a year. And I first was started at the House. Um, I filled a vacancy in November of 2013. So my first session was 2014. So you served a session, was elected into leadership, and, and entering this 2018 year, let's, let's take a look back to the 2017 legislative session. Is there anything that sticks out to you as far as memorable accomplishments, um, Casey, on any bill or legislation that you personally carried? And then certainly as you look at the legislative session uh, from your caucus perspective, uh, what success really jumps out to you? Yeah, I think 2016 was a uh, really, uh, 2017 was a very, very productive session at the Capitol. Um, one of the biggest accomplishments was a bill that I sponsored, um, House or Senate Bill 267. That was the hospital provider fee bill. And um, it was called the Sustainability of Rural Colorado. There were a lot of things that we did in that bill uh, to benefit um, businesses, hospitals, seniors, roads um, in rural Colorado, but also across the state. So the impetus of it was um, that, a, that an existing fee that the state collects was really crowding out all a lot of other revenue under the Tabor cap. The Tabor cap keeps us from um, retaining a lot of the tax revenue that the state collects. So a lot of that revenue that we did collect was getting crowded out by a hospital fee, we needed to move that hospital fee over to an enterprise out from under the Tabor cap that would free up space under the Tabor cap. So as tax revenue comes up, the state is actually allowed to keep and spend that. And it's been a controversial bill um, effort for a long time. This year, because um, we were going over the Tabor cap, we would have to cut something, either education or or hospitals funding or um, or you know higher education, um, in order to stay below the Tabor cap, or we would have had to do this accounting move. A lot of rural hospitals were looking at closing, and that really brought people together to say, let's make this accounting fix. And, and I think it was a huge win. It was bipartisan. In that bill that fixed the hospital provider fee, we also established $100 million annually out of the general fund for transportation. Um, we were bonding that um, and over four, four issuances to put in transportation, 25% has to be for rural areas. We also in that made some significant tax cuts to small business. So 
one thing that's bugged people for a long time about the state of Colorado is our business personal property tax. It can be pre pretty burdensome on small businesses to pull, to keep track of their business personal property, um, submit the forms, um, et cetera, to, uh, to, to be in compliance with the business personal property tax. So a lot more businesses are exempt now from paying that, um, that small business. So between transportation, keeping hospitals open, um, helping um, small businesses, and then we designated $30 million out of the general fund in this bill to help rural schools. Rural schools just uh, often don't have the property tax base to cover uh, much funding, and so we stepped up for rural schools. And then the big thing is because we created space under the Tabor cap this year, coming into the legislative session and coming into the state's new budget, there's more revenue for the state. And there's a lot of demand for that revenue. There's demand um, for K-12 education, higher ed, um, and especially transportation. So it gives us the opportunity to look at some of those things. There's also things on our lists like addressing the opioid crisis. Um, addressing the cost of housing and the need for affordable housing in Colorado, that it just gives us a little more wiggle room to try and do things around those issues for the people of Colorado. Love that. Thanks, Casey, and certainly a bill that we supported as well, understanding the importance uh, in so many areas of this state. Uh, anything that, that you kind of regretted that you weren't able to get over the finish line last year before we jump into this year? You know, there's always unfinished business. There's always times that, um, you know, it takes a couple tries to get something through. Maybe you, the first time you didn't have the right stakeholders or, um, you know, didn't really have the right policy. I think there's, you know, affordable housing is still on the agenda. That hasn't gone away. Um, the, you know, need for transportation funding hasn't ended. We we put two billion into transportation with the hospital provider fee bill last year, but that that's only about a third of the Department of Transportation's what they call their tier one list. So that, that's still something that we have to get done this year, just as a couple of examples. I love that, and that's a great segue into this year coming into 2018. Uh, certainly there's a lot of discussion um, around the state as you enter into Governor Hickenlooper's final year and the national uh, political scene. It's certainly an election year, um, and so we'll kind of come back to that as we get through, but we really want you, uh, on behalf of your, your colleagues and the Democratic Caucus and the House, to really outline some of the priorities that you and your colleagues are focused on for this year. What are your key priorities? as a caucus that you would like to see done in this 2018 year? You know, in 2018, we're, we're proud of the fact that Colorado's economy is one of the strongest in the nation, that people have jobs, are employed, and contributing to the economy. More people are moving to Colorado. But what's happening is um, it, they're just falling behind, that the cost of living is rising faster than wages. And uh, it's it's stressing people out and and their quality of living they feel like is suffering from the growth in Colorado so they have um, uh, concerns about traffic they have concerns about the cost of housing um, they have concerns about you know impacts um, just from growth in general so those are some of the things that we're really talking about and thinking about as we move forward with our legislative agenda um, so we, um, in that regard, we're, we're talking about transportation. We yeah. are talking about um, affordable housing, affordable child care, um, things that are going to improve everyday lives for, you know, hardworking Coloradans. And it'll be, um, as, as people are sort of stressed in their everyday life, what are some things we can do to alleviate that stress? I think our... Um, paid family leave bill is one of those things that for for everyday people gives them an opportunity to relieve some of that stress and that just means uh, paid family leave just means that um, they would pay into a fund and when they don't have um, time off 
when they don't have sick days, it would provide funding to take time off um, so that they can attend, um, so, so that they can have paid sick days that most people in the workplace actually don't have. So that's just one example. Um, when, you, when you look at the increased revenue um, coming into the state, there, there's certainly going to be no shortage of hands wanting to get <laughs> into that pocket of a billion dollars of excess revenue. How do you and your caucus, um, Casey, look at that? What is the best use of those funds? How would you like to see that um, dispersed or spent in this session? I think that there are a lot of unmet needs in Colorado, but there are a few that I would have rise to the top. I think um, K-12 and higher ed, right? So Amendment 23 um, tells us we have to spend a certain amount of money per year um, on students in Colorado on K-12 education. And right now, I think we are not meeting that obligation by about $800 million. So that's a real need. Higher ed, the state of Colorado, whenever it has to cut back, always cuts higher ed first. And if we don't have an educated workforce, if we're not educating our own, if we're always relying on imported talent, then we are failing our own residents. And so I think we have to stem that tide of, of taking money out of higher ed all the time. It's just that's where we make such incredible investments um, in our state. And when you talk about infrastructure, you know, that infrastructure includes human capital. So something we have to be spending money on. The other, so transportation, K-12, higher ed. And this year, I think um, we need to add to that list um, addressing PARA. As you know, PARA is the um, state's pension fund. Um, after it made... It, um, some couple, a couple changes to the way they did their financial modeling. Um, it, it now is that they're, they're now about $32 billion, $33 billion um, in unfunded liability. So PARA made a couple significant changes. They said, we need to change our actuarial tables to reflect that people are living longer. If they're living longer and they're on a pension, that's more money out the door to those retirees. Um, the other change they made is they said we are being too optimistic in what we are assuming our rate of return in the future will be. They lowered that assumed rate of return. If they are projecting lower returns, they therefore have uh, greater unfunded liabilities. So that put them in the situation of saying we have to address these shortfalls. Para, the Para board put together a really, um, I think, solid plan for addressing those unfunded liabilities. It's never easy for anyone to talk about taking benefits away from retirees or for employees when they are, when they are counting on, um, counting on, you know, certain money for their retirement. But as a state, we just can't have a $32 billion liability sitting out there. So that's something I think we really need to address this year, and there has to be some level of state support to do that. The state for years has not been meeting its, um, its ARC, its actuar actuarially required contribution. Our contribution was set in statute at a certain rate, and that wasn't what was necessarily actuarially required. So we... Um, we just have to fix it, and it's going to take shared responsibility between retirees, current state um, and government employees, future employees. There will be an impact to how much folks contribute. There will be an impact to how much benefit they get, um, you know, on the other side of the equation. So it's a difficult problem, but I think we can solve it this year. Love that. Love that sense of optimism. And it's it's great to see some of the proposals, certainly from the governor's office. Our state treasurer, Walker Stapleton, has been pushing several different uh, solutions. Um, and certainly, I think both 
caucuses on the R&D House Senate side have been putting forth some proposals, and I look forward to seeing that come to a successful uh, resolution, ensuring that promises made or promises kept for our para contributors. Um, so many great workers in this state that belong to that system. There's a akin to sausage making going on at the Capitol with the budget process and how we actually define and do our budget. There's been some suggestions that we need to change that process and budgeting. Um, I, I think it may be Cole Wist and some others, Representative Wist, that are leading that charge. Have, are you aware of some of those discussions? Will that impact some of the decision making and the prioritization um, that goes on at the Capitol? So I know they're interested in looking at the process. I think what they want is um, in the joint budget committee is made up of six members, three from the House, three from the Senate. They really want to open up the budget to uh, a lot more legislative input. And as you know, Colorado is one of the few states in the nation that passes a balanced budget each and every year. Many legislatures have been going into special sessions, have been operating on continuing resolutions instead of passing new budgets. I think that, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we are able to meet our goal every year of passing a balanced budget. The idea of opening it up for more input, I think, has validity. It's just in how you do it. I am not at all interested in making the process more politicized. One of Colorado's strengths, you know, the Colorado way really is to be collaborative. And there's three Republicans, three Democrats on the Joint Budget Committee. And, you know, they get work done. So to the extent any process would politicize things and make it less likely to have a balanced budget, I'm just not going to be supportive. If, it, if there's a way to incorporate the other legislators, there are 100 legislatures, legislators total at the Capitol, that their um, expertise and in, input could be used, fantastic. I think, you know, when I was on the agriculture committee i developed a certain level of expertise about the department of natural resources the department of ag and so yes that should be relied upon um but i don't want to um upend the process totally because it's working now it's working better than most states we get a balanced budget and um and and we rely on those joint budget committee members to constantly be negotiating with each other in a way that says, okay, if, if, if we're gonna cut here, are we adding here? How do we get to a balanced number? Um, so, so we have to be really careful in how we do that. I'm gonna throw just you know, a... If we're gonna change the process, how, yeah. how, how can we let more people have input but without blowing up the system? Love that. Yeah, and I, I completely agree that that process, right, the devil's in the details of actually what that looks like. More input's great, but politicizing it is certainly uh, probably not the direction any of us would like to see. Um, a couple of topics I'll just kind of throw out to you, Casey. Um, rural broadband uh, it has been a, a pretty big discussion right now. Uh, what do you see uh, that the state can do to uh, increase access uh, to broadband in some of our rural areas? Yeah, you know, rural broadband is a top priority in my district. I represent very rural areas of the state, and broadband is life or death in rural areas. So it's absolutely a priority. I think it was mentioned in the Senate president's speech, the speaker's pre speech, the governor's speech, and we've actually introduced a bipartisan bill to Republicans in the Senate, to Democrats in the House. Um, I'm the lead sponsor in the House, and I think we're going to be able to direct money that currently is being used um, to support uh, landlines and, and state money that we are going to redirect to broadband. You know, it's the 21st century, we should be supporting 21st century technology. And wow. I think it's going to so be, true. you know, around $100 million. And it's so critical. And it's, it's taken a while. I worked on this issue last year. So I guess I should have answered when you said something you didn't get done last year. <laughs> you know, I tried with rural broadband. Um, 
Senator Don Corum and I worked together last year. We didn't get it done. There was business opposition. Um, some of them want to benefit from the money that they, in, in how it's used now and didn't want to change that. Some want to make sure if we're using it in broadband that it's done the right way. I th with a lot of work we've spent with those businesses and we, we just, everyone agrees it's a top goal to get that money out of the door and deployed towards broadband. So I think we're going to be able to get it done this year. Wonderful. Uh, marijuana is certainly uh, resurfaced uh, nationally and here in Colorado uh, with Senator Gardner kind of taking on Attorney General Sessions on marijuana. Are, are we where the state needs to be? Do you feel that we've got the right kind of controls? Um, and where do you see that moving forward? You know, so Attorney General Sessions repealed the coal memo. The coal memo laid out for states uh, the parameters for um, how to keep the U.S. government out of uh, state efforts to legalize marijuana. L lifting the coal memo doesn't really serve any good purpose. I can't imagine what he was thinking. Um, it said if you keep marijuana out of kids, if you keep marijuana out of the black market, keep it from crossing state lines, then we're going to leave you alone. And Colorado's been doing um, you know, agrees with those goals and has been, been doing a lot to make sure that the system that voters supported and today support at even a higher level than they did when it was passed in 2013 um, is, is um, a responsible system. Last year, uh, Cole Wist and I worked on a bill together that addressed one lingering issue that did lead to uh, gray market sales. That was when um, people were growing a lot of plants at home. They were growing 100, 200, 300 plants. It did allow marijuana to get into the black market, or as we called it, gray market. Um, we addressed that and that authority is being used to, to make sure that you know the marijuana that's been grown and sold is in the regulated industry or is for patient use at home um, only. So, so I think we've, as a state, really addressed concerns. Um, I really hope the feds stay out of our system. It's, that's because it's been an effective system and it's what voters want. When the uh, final gavel comes down um, in May, uh, what does a successful session look like to you? What do you want to see accomplished in these final couple minutes of our interview here? You know, I really, really believe in um, that, that voters want their legislators to work together. They want to see uh, compromise when it um, is for the good of Colorado. They don't want to see people entrenched in ideology. So for me, a, a successful session is we do find common ground on transportation, on para. We, speaking of unanswered or unresolved issues, I worked on the um, – the, the hospital provider fee bill that did have a drafting error in it and meant um, reduced yeah. money for RTD and other special districts. All of the people involved in the bill said, oh, yeah, that's a, that was a mistake. Let's fix it. We made a mistake. It's our responsibility. And for reasons that I really still don't understand, it became completely political for no real reason. I just wanted to take a common sense approach. Um, I do think this session – we are going to be able to get that done, take a common sense approach to fix the mistake that we made that results in, you know, lower funding for the Science and Cultural Facilities District, which is a well, well loved program that supports all, a lot of our um, museums and zoos and cultural activities in Colorado. And then also that reduced funding um, unwittingly toward to RTD. RTD is um, you know, my my residents are mad at RTD frequently, <laughs> but that doesn't mean they want to cut the funding and therefore cut services. That's just not what they want. So I think we can um, get it done this year and, you know, make give people what they want, which is um, just focus on getting stuff done. 
And we hear that over and over, and I think that that's at play at the national level all the way down to state and local politics here in the state of Colorado, and certainly something I think that, that Colorado's been pretty well known for, being able to roll up the sleeves, work together in a collaborative way, the spirit of the West. And so thank you for your service, first and foremost, uh, Casey. We appreciate um, you coming on air today and sharing some of your priorities. Uh, we look forward to collaborating and working with you as the session moves forward and your colleagues there in the, in the House and ensuring that the needs of all Coloradoans and certainly the business interests are taken care of and met. Thank you and have a great session. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Alex and Drex, for having me. Have a lovely day, Casey. Thank you. Thanks for joining Take us. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.